Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. It's been a year since various groups petitioned against the cybercrime law because of its controversial provisions like the clause on online libel and the takedown clause, which allows government to block access to online content even without a court order. The Supreme Court hasn't decided on this law after temporarily stopping its implementation, but we expect a decision soon. Attorney J.J. Decini is one of the petitioners. He's one of the country's top IP lawyers. He joins us today to talk about why this is important and what does it mean for Filipinos. JJ, thank you for coming to Rappler. Yes, thank and, you. And full disclosure, JJ is one of our of Rappler's retained counsels because he's one of the best. Anyway, <laughs> JJ, so so what is this? Why should people care about the cybercrime law? Well, um, uh, the big issue, of course, in many people's minds is, uh, is the provision on libel. Um, so people are concerned about uh, many things that they do online. They post many things. People are very opinionated online, and sometimes they they uh, rub people the wrong way, and they don't want to be at the uh, at the wrong end of a, of a libel suit. So uh, we've seen many instances where even just a, a Facebook uh, status post can lead to a a, a libel suit. Um, so I think that that's one area where people are concerned. There's a freedom of expression issue, mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, uh, there's a, there's also a um, a provision for double liability in the Cybercrime Prevention Act. Uh, it says that even though you've been charged with libel under the Revised Penal Code, you can be charged again for online libel under the Cybercrime Prevention Act, and then you will be charged. Uh, you can uh, you're open to a greater liability in the Cybercrime Prevention Act. So it's double liability. Uh, so something like uh, libel can get you as much as uh, 10 years in jail, um, or at maximum. Uh, so it's one of those things where uh, now you're, you're violating uh, the right against double jeopardy. So you're supposed to be protected against double jeopardy. So these are constitutional, uh, constitutionally protected rights. Um, and then there's the right to privacy. Mm -hmm. The Cybercrime Prevention Act um, uh, allows the police authorities uh, to um, uh, monitor your data traffic without securing a warrant, uh, in fact, without getting any warrant at all or even reporting the matter to any judicial authority. It is merely on their own authority that they can engage in that kind of surveillance. So I think that violates the right to privacy. And then, of course, the takedown clause, which uh, the, the, even the Solicitor General uh, did not want to defend and admits that it's unconstitutional, uh, allows the Secretary uh, of Justice to take down content uh, upon a mere uh, uh, complaint. Mm -hmm. uh, a prima facie finding uh, and then so that when you tie that up with something like libel then you're talking about again freedom of expression and the ability of a of a secretary of justice to censor to become a, a censor so to speak of any content that appears online so these are these are fundamental rights that that we care about uh, and if we care about them then we're concerned about uh, that these rights are being infringed as we interact more online. So it seemed that uh, there was no argument that there were parts of the law that was flawed, but let me be devil's advocate. Yes. Isn't there some need to try to control uh, what comes out? Online libel, for example. Yes. There are lots of things people write that isn't true or, or is libelous, but there are no laws to really deal with it. How, how, what, what is the, where should we be heading with this? Okay, so the, actually on the issue of libel, um, uh, Harry Roque, Professor Harry Roque, was the one who took the lead on the on the issue of the constitutionality of libel itself, whether libel should be uh, decriminalized. And he took the position, I think, uh, consistent with uh, the views of the United Nations, that uh, libel should be decriminalized and be turned into a civil action. So if you want to hold somebody uh, liable for libel, you just file a civil suit. Don't throw them into jail. Uh, precisely because there are concerns about not only freedom of expression but also freedom of the press. Uh, in many instances, it's actually the media that is that are the targets of uh, libel suits. And even though there are there's case law uh, that that gives media uh, personalities or me the media outlets, for example, some a good defense. So this is the New York Times versus Sullivan decision. What happens locally is that even though this this protection is uh, is there, the criminal case is still filed, and the the journalist still has to to bring up that defense uh, on their own. So uh, there are many cases out there where the, the intention of the, say, the public figure who is attacked is not really to, to protect his reputation against libel, but really to, to stifle any this public discussion of issues uh, that, that are being discussed by the journalist in that particular libel suit. Um, and, and with something like this, uh, what are the safeguards now for people like that? Well, the safeguards are there. 
uh, unfortunately, uh, enforcement has been sort of spotty. So uh, let's say that um, a, a media outlet uh, says something negative about a public figure. Now, under the New York Times versus Sullivan rule, unless there's uh, actual malice, yes. uh, the the personality, the public person, is not, will not be able to file the criminal case against the, the media outlet. What happens here is that there is a preliminary investigation conducted by the prosecutors, by the fiscals, and if they find, uh, and, and a lot of them do, uh, they figure it's not our place to, to determine whether or not this defense is available. It's up to the courts to, to determine that. So they initiate, they file the case, or, and a warrant of arrest is, uh, is issued against the, uh, the defendants, right. and then it's up to the, the media outlet to defend itself in court. Now, uh, in a situation like that, uh, certainly it becomes a deterrent now you don't want to now you when the next you story comes in you may yes. not want to yes. to bring the uh, to bring the story to the to the public and, and and when it comes to public figures there's a public interest uh, uh, public discussion of, of matters of uh, certainly things like governance for example are important for, for a well-functioning democracy so it's important that we protect these rights and criminalizing libel uh, challenges those rights so in, in, in that very true sense, uh, there is a need to uh, sort of decriminalize libel. And so that's one option that the court uh, sort of left open. Mm. Uh, it's a possibility. The, the court might actually go back, come back with a decision and say libel itself is, uh, is unconstitutional. What that means is that uh, all libel cases that have been filed that are in the courts right now will be dismissed. Right. All people in jail who uh, possibly no? uh, who have been convicted of libel will uh, will be set free. So it's it's possible that uh, the court decision can can, can be as far reaching as that uh, when it comes to the area of libel. You've been watching the way the proceedings have have gone. Um, aside from this, what other ripple effects do you expect from a, this decision? Uh, so that that would be a big uh, win, huge, I think. Actually. A huge, be a huge win. Because I think the, particularly for freedom of expression. Right. Um, so, I mean, we've seen even after the Cybercrime Prevention Act, TRO was in place, uh, the cyber perling uh, case shows us that uh, journalists are still, or in that case a blogger, but still a, a, a media outlet, uh, covering uh, public events, covering uh, public figures, are still under threat of, of libel. So, uh, the court decriminalizing libel would be a huge win, uh, not only for freedom of expression, but particularly for freedom of the press. Um, and you know, I, I think, uh, and to, I think to a large degree also the the PNP might uh, and the NBI might uh, heave a sigh of relief in that uh, a lot of their cases now will be will be dismissed because it seems that they they uh, field a lot of cases involving uh, online so Facebook type libel, so those cases presumably will go away uh, if the if the if it's decriminalized and now it, it's a civil suit, mm -hmm. uh, so that that would be better. What about the actual proceedings? Anything stand out from what you've seen? Um, you know, just going back, uh, one of the things that, has, that have happened, and uh, I know this is, I, I guess I can't say this without uh, uh, sounding like I'm uh, promoting myself, but one of the things that happened uh, while this case was pending was the Supreme Court adopted a new rule. Yes. Uh, it used to be that the first person who files the case is, gets the title of the case. Uh, and uh, this, so this case is now, uh, well, initially was uh, titled Biraugo versus, uh, uh, I think, the Secretary of Justice. Uh, but I think there have been so many cases where Mr. Biraugo uh, was the first to file. Yes. Uh, and so the Supreme Court changed the rule. And they, what they do is they look at the petitions and they say, which is the most, the weightiest, substantive, so substantive uh, substantial, brought the most substantial uh, arguments. And then that will become the title of the case. So what happened here is that it actually, our petition, although we were third, uh, was selected by the court. So now it's Dicini versus, uh, uh, versus uh, Secretary of Justice. And um, if, if that is any indication, then I would think that... Uh, the, the issues that we raised were certainly, uh, you know, there's some preliminary determination by the court that these are the weightier issues. And, and these are the issues I discussed that you earlier. Just discussed. Yes. yes, yes. Online libel, freedom of expression issues, double liability, the right to privacy, the right. take down clause. Yes. Um, let's, can, can I just focus on, on the right to privacy? Yes. Um, the, the way you, you said that it would monitor data traffic without, without any without a warrant. warrant. Yes. Um, if you're talking about data traffic on social media, for example, isn't that out there? Isn't that uh, open to the public? Anyway, people have pushed it out to the public. Couldn't that be monitored by anyone? 
That's interesting. I never really thought advocate. of yeah, yeah. And I, I never really thought of what is data traffic when it comes to uh, social media. Uh, so, in other words, I could see your likes. You could see the posts. You can see who you're talking to. Uh, okay. Now, data traffic, uh, as contemplated by the law, would, would would cover that. But that's already publicly available. Yes. And then, right. and, uh, actually, uh, there are uh, services that are available mm -hmm. that you can subscribe to. These are paid services, as far as I know. And I can I can uh, use that, and uh, I can see all your social media. I can go to a person's, uh, enter that person's email, uh, enter his Facebook uh, uh, account, and I'll see whatever he's done online. That right. is publicly available. Right. So that, that information is already out there. Right. That data digital traffic, footprint. Right? Yeah. The data traffic that uh, the law contemplates are things like um, uh, going. To the, the law enforcement agencies can go to your telco and say, here's Maria Ressa's number. And who has she called? How long have the calls been? Yes. Uh, and when were the calls made? Incoming, outgoing. Uh, they don't know. They, they cannot tap. They don't know the content of the conversation. Uh, but they would get all that information. Okay. They can even okay. get information about who's texting you and who, you, who are you texting. So okay. the numbers. That's incredible. Yeah, and yeah, may yeah, not yeah. identify who these people are, but there are very easy ways. Even just You can just even pretend to be a wrong number. right? You said, oh, I'm sorry. I got your number from uh, Maria. Uh, who's this again? And then you can get that person's identity. So you have data traffic that can very easily turn into uh, actual information, right? Supposedly anonymous information, uh, that and not really public information because this is information that only the telco knows. Yes. So things like uh, uh, what happens within your own IP. So you're, you have an internet connection at home. You have a DSL connection. What IP addresses are you going to? What are you visiting? How long are you staying at those sites? Correct. What are you doing? That's scary. That's scary. NSA. Yeah. Here you go. Um, but yeah. Oh, well, they're doing it already. I guess yeah. that's your point. Exactly. Right. 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 Um, well, let me. There's some questions coming in from social media. Uh -huh. um, from Lamberto Laparan Santos. Other countries have their own versions of the cybercrime law. Would would it be disadvantageous on our part not to have one? So he's correct. So uh, there is the uh, EC Council uh, Council of Europe Cybercrime Treaty, the Budapest Convention, from you know upon which we base our law. Yes. And certainly, there we want to be part of that convention because there are uh, international cooperation obligations. So it would be easier for uh, victims, Filipino victims, to seek. Uh, assistance from law enforcement agencies all over the world that are part of the convention. Yes. So that would be held very helpful. And, and actually, this is one of the bad things that, that the TRO has put in, that these provisions have sort of been put in, so have, have been suspended. Some uh, additional authority on the part of law enforcement officers to get a search warrant to look at content, for right. example, or get subscriber information from the telcos. These are important uh, uh, rights uh, or uh, sorry, authority right or powers that can be given to law enforcement agencies uh, that are in the cybercrime uh, prevention act so I do agree that uh, we do need a, a cybercrime prevention act I do agree that uh, law enforcement uh, should be given more authority uh, to, to investigate these are different types of investigations that that uh, are not necessarily do not necessarily go into physical spaces uh, but go into sort of the electronic realms and and but actually reveal a lot more about people than, than visiting their physical space right, right. right. Uh, another another questions from at air Kurkuran Rowan a H right. Rowan with evolving technologies that emerge every three to six months how do you think the cybercrime law will be able to catch up well, you know, it's it, uh, the the provisions that we took from the uh, how do you call this from the cybercrime uh, sorry from the cybercrime treaty are very broadly worded. Uh, so they they are sort of quite technology neutral. So they, they I think they should be enough. Uh, and, and, and if something new comes up, then we can go back to Congress and have an amendment. So I well, don't think that's... In possible. the earlier question, uh, the government has recently said that, that cybercrime, for example, pornography, child pornography yes. on the internet, uh, part of the reason they can't move on this, and there was a recent arrest of Australians here in the Philippines, part of a global ring. Right. Um, the PNP has said that, the, that this is thriving in the Philippines, and part of the reason they can't stop it is because we don't have a cybercrime law. What's well, your reaction to that? Child, child pornography. Actually, if you look at the, the Cybercrime Prevention Act, there's a provision for child pornography. Yes. But it really didn't say anything. What it did was it referred back to the, to the child pornography law that we already that have. That we already have, correct. Which means that... The it child pornography, yes, it's already sufficient. I mean, Congress has already made that determination, and online child pornography is already is already punished under that law. So, um, 
it's a it's a nice thing to say. I think p- perhaps what the p- perhaps the law enforcement officers might have been quoted out of context. I think what they probably meant was it's difficult for them, more difficult for them to investigate these instances, because uh, one of the major hurdles for law enforcement agencies is getting the cooperation of the service providers. The Cybercrime Prevention Act would solve those problems. Yeah. Uh, mm, and and none I, and certainly well my petition does not question those provisions other petitions do so uh, uh, some some petitioners have questioned the entire law and th- those are under threat of being stricken down so my I feel like my petition is sort of taking the the uh, middle middle of the road uh, sort of compromise where we we save some and then we take out the bad parts yes yes um, what's the what's your one your best case scenario for this decision, what things do you want to see happen? Me? Ah, well, of course. That's a very good. That's a very good question. I, I think that uh, it's good for the court to. I think it would be good if the court takes out libel altogether. Mm-hmm. So they co- render it unconstitutional, and they invalidate all other previous convictions on on uh, um, or, or set people free, right? Yes. Who are, are now in jail for libel, uh, and then dismiss all those cases. Uh, so I think that's a good thing if they do that. Uh, that would be that would do wonders for freedom of expression and freedom of the press. Uh, and of course, I mean the, the provisions that I've that uh, that I've mentioned, I'd like to see them all stricken down. Uh, there are a couple of provisions actually that I'm concerned about that I would that I, I don't think necessarily there are constitutional issues, but they're they're not very well worded. And this is the provision on cyber sex. And the provision on uh, domain names. So there, there's some, uh, even the provision on identity theft. Mm-hmm. These are, uh, especially on identity theft, the, the provision is quite vague. Uh, and also the provision on cyber sex, uh, where it seems that it, you only punish uh, the person to whom uh, consideration is given, but not the person who's giving consideration. So the, it's sort of one sided, it sort of uh, uh, punishes only one party as opposed to both. Mm. And, and it uh-huh. seems to me that if both parties are consenting adults and they are engaged in a one-to-one, um, um, how do you call that, interaction, right, yes. of that nature, Cons- yes. why should it be only one. Why should it be a, uh, no, why should it be a criminal offense if, if it's two, between two consenting adults? Ah, mm. right. okay, uh, interesting. So there's that issue, right? Uh, it's, hmm. not, it's not pornography because it's not one-to-many. Yes. Uh, you know, the big issue there is the exchange of money. If I exchange money with you for you to do this, is that uh, is that a crime where there's no physical contact? That's the I think that's the challenge really in, in cyber sex. So interesting, um, right? Prostitution. I guess I guess where's the line with prostitution uh, in something no prostitution like that? Right. In the sense that there's no, no physical contact. Right. Right. So I mean, sex services though it's still right. It would I guess it would fall under that under that category, but you know I think the the big question is um, it, what. If there are, if the social harm mm. is there, Mm-mm. right? Uh, certainly, compared to prostitution, this is better in the sense that there's no physical, there's no physical contact, um, and that there's there's actually so there's there's money to be made, but there's there's less risk. Uh, but I mean, you know, you could argue also that that kind of cyber sex. Uh, leads to other crimes, you know, leads to things like human trafficking, yes. leads to things yes. like, uh, may lead to, f- uh, to pornography, may lead to uh, other things. So you can say it's, it's an entry crime that let's penalize it now so that we can prevent fur- uh, further problems in the future. So if once the Supreme Court decision is out, they yes. rule on provisions of the, of the law, what happens next? Well, the TRO would be lifted. Okay. Uh, there will be, presumably... If they uh, rule against the law, will the law have to be rewritten? If they rule against the law in its entirety, uh, then you are back to square one. We're back to the E-Commerce Act as the the, the cybercrime law that we have, and Congress would then need to reenact a okay. cybercrime prevention act. There are already bills. The DOJ already uh, filed its uh, amended cybercrime law, and uh, I think PIFA, that's the Philippine Internet. Um, Freedom. Uh, um, yes, they have the alliance. NCPIF, right? Yes, they the, do. A crowdsourced, yes, the crowdsourced uh, internet cybercrime yes, it's, law. It's a pretty, not just cybercrime, but it's, it's everything. Yes. Uh, I forget what they call it, but it's, a, it's actually quite a, a heavy piece of uh, legislation because it covers not only cybercrime, but sort of all other related issues. It covers privacy, it covers telecommunications policy, it covers open access, open data. So it's a lot of things, and uh, it's quite. Uh, it's quite difficult, actually. Uh, from a strategic standpoint, it's not likely to be enacted 
because when you have when you have a uh, piece of legislation that affects too many things then it's easy to strike it down i mean to to block it in congress and say there's a group that's working you know, that's on this working or against that has this yeah they're only concerned about one part of the law but they'd rather see the whole law not pass through Whereas uh, if you s just stick to cybercrime, then you know it's a specific sector and you, you can limit the exposure. And therefore, you minimize the chances of uh, opposition coming from, uh, from different sectors. So this is if they strike the whole law down. What if they just say um, online libel? What if they only make a decision on one part of it? What happens next? Will the law continue? Will the yes. TRO just be lifted? Yes. There's a separability clause. Okay. I think Senator Angara was quoted in a, in a news article a few, I think, at the beginning of this week, saying that there is a separability clause. If one provision is considered uh, invalid, then the rest that are not uh, invalid will continue. So that's actually the approach that I've taken. Uh, I have four things that I'm concerned about. Strike those four down and then let the, let the rest through. There's something else that did pass though, right? This Data Privacy Act. Isn't yes. there a Data Privacy Act? And has that, you were very alarmed about that uh, yes. to begin with. Has that been impl implemented in any way? Has uh, been currently it's, uh, what's the word? It's in suspension because the law, well, to a certain degree, so there is a provision in the law that says that implementation by existing businesses of the uh, Data Privacy Act uh, will only happen six months after the implementing rules are enacted. And the implementing rules cannot be enacted unless the Data Privacy Commission, Na National Privacy Commission, can be constituted. And the President has not named the Chairman oh and the, the two Commissioners and it's already been... But that's still a law that's problematic, is that correct, in um, your mind? It's, it has a lot of... Uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, provisions there are compliance issues for many types of entities mm -hmm. uh, fortunately there's a blanket uh, uh, exemption for journalism so if you're going to use the uh, private information for journalistic purposes it's exempted from the law mm -hmm. um, and so but I think it, it's more of a, a compliance issue for a lot of online businesses and a lot of a lot of uh, real world businesses including marketers so if you're engaged in uh, data mining you're engaged in big data uh, depending on what you're doing with the information, you might be affected by this. So let's say you're a bank and you're going to use big data uh, in order to try to provide uh, specific types of services for a targeted audience based yes. on what you learn on big data. Uh, you might, uh, you might, you know, you need to check your process to see if you're uh, you know, coming to terms with the Data Privacy Act. It's so interesting the law was created before the d big data has actually even been implemented efficiently, before the right. uses have been found. Right. right. Um, so let me ask you, we talked about what happens if parts of it are struck down. Is there any chance that the TRO would just be lifted, that the, su the Supreme Court will say there's nothing wrong with this? Uh, yes. I mean, anything's possible. Certainly the Supreme Court can say in its entirety this, is, this should be uh, upheld. Uh, I'm sure it's happened before where a ch law has been challenged and the, the Supreme Court refused to uh, take the view of the petitioners. But given the way the arguments have gone and the yes. Supreme Court, do you think there's a possibility that Well, I think, I think Section uh, 19, the takedown clause, uh, there's no question. I mean, if the Solicitor General himself said that uh, it's unconstitutional, mm -hmm. then uh, they've basically given up on that issue. So right. at the very least, I think the, the court will, will, will agree. Uh, it would be very strange for the, the court to take a position contrary to the the parties, but both parties have come to the court saying that this is unconstitutional. Although it's not impossible, the court can say, well, we take a different view. Uh, but uh, if you ask me in terms of odds, I would think that um, as in many things, the yes. middle road is actually the, 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 the usual path that's taken. And I think the middle road is strike down some, keep, keep the rest. So um, it's just a question of, I think it's just a question of how much. A question from social media again, Neil Lacuna Pagalaran. Uh, what's a better alternative for this frozen law given that cyber crimes like skimming, identity theft, credit card fraud are at an alarming state? Okay, so credit card fraud uh, is covered by another law uh, that's RA 8484, that's Access Devices uh, Regulation Law. So they can take a look at that. To, uh, so, uh, so this skimming, has no, yeah, no skimming, effect. Skimming is uh, taking the MagStripe data, yes. up, right? So yes. that's. Uh, Credit cards are known as access devices. So if you make uh, fake access devices, if you're in possession of tools to make access, uh, fake access devices, you can, be, you can be charged under that law. So there, uh, my understanding is that I think the PNP sometime this year, um, uh, how do you call that? They, they went against or had an operation against a, uh, a, crime, uh, a group that actually traffics in, uh, in this kind of data and they charge yes. them under this law. Is it 
is this law written well enough to anticipate the technological changes that are happening? This is a question earlier on. Okay. So, I mean, uh, so this law, a lot of it is based on uh, the Cybercrime Prevention, uh, uh, sorry, the Cybercrime Treaty, which is an international um, uh, convention. And uh, in that sense, whenever we copy from a, from a foreign source such as that, uh, we actually end up with better results. Uh, because they, they, they think it through, the people who write it uh, think it through. So when you look at, and I think the Chief Justice during the oral arguments hinted at this, that when you look at the provisions of the law, the provisions that, uh, that copy almost verbatim the yes. Cybercrime Treaty, those provisions are okay. When we started adding our own provisions, such as the one on domain names, such as the one on yes. cybersex, and the one on um, identity theft, that's when the language becomes uh, loose and difficult to, to implement and sort of difficult to understand. Uh, and so there's, there's, a, there's a wordsmithing issue, I think, with respect to the Cybercrime Prevention Act. Uh, myself, I'm not comfortable with these, these provisions, but uh, uh, I didn't think they were unconstitutional. But it's entirely possible that the court could strike them down. Uh, and and it's certainly, I think, that uh, there's some recognition that the, the quality uh, of the the craft, the crafting of the provisions uh, went down, uh, you know, dipped when it came to sort of local crafting. Yeah. Um, one of the things that isn't covered in this law is cyberbullying, but it's yes. happening and people globally are really concerned about it. In fact, I don't think we really have a definition for it yet in the Philippines, although we've had instances. Um, right. One of the guys who really talked about this is Chris Lau. Right. He, he claimed he was cyberbullied to the point that he thought about committing suicide. Um, how do we deal with something like this? You know, it's a difficult problem. Bullying itself is a, is a, is a big issue, uh, even just real-world bullying. Uh, Cyberbullying is a, uh, a new phenomenon. Uh, and I, I'm not, I think in some places it's, it's a crime. I mean, the, it's the, a crime the, in the United States, yeah. The big issue is, you know, what do you do? Uh, and, uh, how, and how do you prevent it? Uh, so in the case of Chris Lau, uh, he gets attacks from people he doesn't know. He, he yes. gets emails from people. He gets comments. So one of the things that you can do is you can shut that off to the extent that that's possible, I'm not sure. So you sort of take a digital vacation and say, I'm going to shut everything off. I'm going to go in air, <laughs> airplane mode and I'm not going to listen to any of that. Uh, I think the, the issue is uh, with respect more for minors mm -hmm. uh, where they are more vulnerable and I think Perhaps the the better thing to do is not necessarily to make it a crime, but to give uh, these to assistance and, yes. and, and give people coping mechanisms to deal with that. Uh, of course, I'm, I think that it's important <coughs> for people who see this happening, so from a societal level, to sort of make it socially unacceptable to engage in that kind of behavior, to uh, to tell people, uh, you know, uh, stop that. That's not that's no good. So I I, I reminded uh, of a time I attended a. Uh, a, a baseball game yes. uh, in the U.S. Uh, and, and I'd heard about um, the soccer matches in Europe where people go crazy. The, 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 how do you call it? the audience are separated by chain link fences, but despite that, there are riots. Uh, and what happened was we were in a group and um, there, was, there was somebody who's, who said something very negative about the opposing team. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, there was a, a, a gentleman uh, who stood up and talked to that guy and said, you're not supposed to do that. So there are very strong norms yes. uh, with respect to baseball norms. games, right? Yeah, they said, yeah, like, yeah. you're not supposed to, you know, s uh, slam the, the other team so much. So what I'm saying is that societal norms can solve the, the problem of bullying if mm -hmm. bullying itself is considered to be something that's negative and something that needs to be addressed. It's really hard because, again, if somebody's trying to intimidate you, um, where does intimidation turn into bullying and then where does cyberbullying, the cyberbullying cyber mean that when the hive comes at you and it's, it's a tough thing but they have criminalized it I mean right. in the US. I think the, the, US. the tough thing is that if you're the victim of bullying, yes. oftentimes um, you have nowhere to turn. Correct. It's even socially unacceptable for you to turn to someone. Right. Right. So if you're, if you're a kid and you're, you've been the, you're the victim of bullying, 
uh, if you go, if you tell the teacher, it just seems you've broken some code, yes. right? That you're not supposed to talk about those things. But it's a sort of it, this sort of code is what perpetuates, allows uh, bullying to perpetuate itself. So in this, without any kind of laws or even definition in this country, we don't have any place anyone to turn to if you're cyber. Right. So I'm saying maybe society itself, we can create norms around bullying and say and and, and stop each we stop each other. Yeah. Right. That's you say, that's, that's what that's we bullying, wind up saying. That. Yes. So what I'm yes. Saying, Perhaps an, you know we, that could be Change something like norms. an NGO, or that could be like a uh, an NGO for social media. <laughs> social, you know, I mean, somebody, it's like a it's like a ribbon for for AIDS and, yes. and whatnot. So these are these are changing uh, social norms and, and views about uh, changes that we see in, in in society. And I think that's what we need for cyberbullying. I think that would be more effective than saying it's a crime, because yes. then it could still happen and people will just do it anonymously. Oh, that's so and that's the reason why they do it anyway, because it's anonymous. Correct. Right? Correct. Right. So unless you have less anonymity, it will continue. Something there, that, that happened to Chris Law will happen. Well, there are also the studies that show that, that off the, the way social media is set up now is it bypasses certain of your own defenses because it, it's much more emotive. Um, uh -huh. it's, okay. it's fascinating, this stuff. Yes. Let me go back. There are several questions now. Um, and let me pick this one up from our head of investigative from Chai Hofilenya. She's picking up on, on what government can do during without the cybercrime law. And she's asking, on investigations by the government, if they obtain the necessary permits or warrants, will these be more acceptable? So the answer would be yes. But I think the challenge for the NBI and the PNP now is that when they go to the court and say, we want a warrant, uh, for a particular type of, say, sur online surveillance. Yes. Uh, typically, by the time the court uh, gets to that warrant, it's done. Yeah. It's done. Yes. Uh, and the the related problem is, so you can ask the telco to say, hold the data. You know, we're not asking, yes. we're not getting yes. it yet, but give us a chance to go to court to get it. And in, in many instances, the telcos will say, will not heed that call. Uh, so there's that there's that problem for for the law enforcement agencies where they they uh, they want to get the information but it's not preserved in time and the cybercrime prevention app will make these sorts of things very explicit that the the pnp can say hold that data for six months and then they can extend that period while they're waiting for a court order to come to come through it's a bit like uh the authority of the uh the anti-money laundering council yes yes within a very short period yes. of time they can get a freeze get order right, away, right? Yeah. so like yeah. one or two days you have the freeze order in place and then you have a six month period where you can go to a lower court and and prove sort of yes. uh at the pace of the court of the judiciary so they can come up with a more permanent order um this is the last question from social media from at audi Ru, and this is going back to libel which is kind of how we started the yeah. the program won't decriminalizing libel make people less reluctant to commit it um i think it means if we decriminalize libel will it happen more often so the answer i guess would be i mean uh, from i guess from an economic standpoint right? yes. when you take out the disincentive then the, the people would actually do it more um you know it's criminalized now and people are still doing a lot of it yes right uh so uh the, the bigger the larger question is uh is this this so it's it's a it's a it's a balancing act no? Sh should we allow people to in, uh to to charge other or to, to put other people at threat of jail uh for libel um at the cost of seeing freedom of expression at stake or freedom of the press a chilling I think, I think effect on the a chilling yeah, effect on, on those media. rights yes you know and and and, and you know one-to-one -one discussion that might be liable i might be i might be uh yeah it might be a crime yes but if you if we're going to maintain it as a crime and as a result i cannot speak out publicly on issues that are of great public interest yes because i might be under threat of libel right i think this these sets of rights are more are weightier than the private claim to to libel you know, and I certainly, we're not saying there's no redress. We're yes. saying, let's make it a civil suit. You know, it's so funny you know. because this is actually already a societal reaction to a law that existed, right? Yes. Before, it was civil crime. It, was, it wasn't a criminal law. And then people felt that, that there were still too many libel cases. And so they, they thought it would ha have a more deterrent effect by making it criminal. You remember that? I remember be covering this when it became criminal. I mean, uh, online. Yeah, n not even online, but nor but normal libel, like libel in, in general. On yeah, I, I think I think um, you know the, the the standard argument is that so, so globally the trend is towards decriminalizing. Yes. I think we're one of few countries that that, that keep it uh, on the on the criminal books. 
or keep it a crime. Um, so there's that thing where should we follow the global trend? Yeah. It's certainly that argument. And the UN has already uh, determined that, uh, that they believe that it is consistent with our obligations uh, to the United Nations, uh, Charter on uh, Civil and Political Liberties, that uh, libel be decriminalized. So um, <coughs> if these things are going to be consistent, if we are going to be consistent across the board, then as a modern society, I think perhaps that is the decision we need to make. And, and if it's at the cost of people getting hurt online because uh, things are being said, then, uh, then you know, we, I say go, you can go to the courts. Yes. Right. Well, but in many things, you know what I, what I find about online um, libel uh, is that people get very upset for a period of time, but then uh, after, you know, after there's a 48 hour time period, I think, where you, you that's yes, actually when I tell yes. people, I know you're upset, but, you know, sleep on it, give 48 hours. If it still is a good idea to, to file a case or do whatever you want to do, then then go ahead. And in many instances, these things are just, because the, the, when you file a libel suit, you are perpetuating it, right? Yes. Whereas if you ignore it, then after 48 hours, people's attentions are on something else. Yes, yes. Right? And, and I, you brought this up as a difficulty here. I mean, in, in general, when from probe days when I was younger, mm -hmm. uh, people really who didn't want you to write about them, who didn't want you to expose them, would just file a libel case to try to either intimidate, harass, or right. if you're a small company, which was we were in probe, Newsbreak as well, right. uh, to try to bankrupt you. That's right. Filing the, the, you know, going back to it. Didn't work then, but this seems like a whole new new ball game. Let me, let me right. go to something we didn't discuss at all, which mm. is cyber espionage. Okay. Um, from the NSA and the Snowden doc uh, documents, we know for sure <laughs> yeah. it, it's happening. Do it's we happening. need legislation for it? Uh, we, we can legislate all we like. Yeah, it's going to happen anyway. It's going to happen. Uh, right. It's going to happen because, oh well, okay, the, the only way we can prevent that from happening is if the, I guess the Philippine consumer or the Philippine government says that mandates that traffic within the Philippines, for example, is, min is kept in the Philippines. So if I'm going to send an email from somebody in a PH domain to another PH domain, yes, uh, then it it does not leave. It does not go to the United States. Yes. The problem now is that since we have uh, the the ISPs and the telcos are connected uh, to not necessarily to each other, but certainly have stronger links to international uh, peers. Yes. Then what happens is if I send an email from uh, say my my domain, which is dcini.ph, to right. Rappler, correct. Right? It goes more la more often than not. It will go say to LA, correct, and then go back. Yes. It's when it enters the US that it's yes, and and it will usually enter the US because the fastest traffic goes to the US. What happens when I press send on my computer is that uh, at that moment uh, my the software asks, "What's the fastest way to send this?" It queries the system, and more often than not, it will end up in the US. And apparently, the, uh, the US have determined that even for things like voice traffic, this happens also. Uh, but not necessarily here. So th the U.S. Is, is uniquely positioned to get this information. Mm -hmm. And since they don't require warrants for surveillance on non-U.S. citizens, then the, uh, the NSA is free to look at. And I, I would and assume they have, yes. that they are looking. Uh, but, you know, it's not as if it's individuals looking. Uh, I think um, a lot of it is automated. When issues are flagged then it goes to a, a, an analyst and then he will then somebody will read your emails and if they feel that there's some concern they might tap your social media all your social media accounts to, to track who you are if they think you are a risk yes to them and certainly the issue here is uh, terrorism right and i feel that uh, i think they believe that they need to do this yes. to prevent uh, an attack such as 9 11. Yes. And certainly they, they credit themselves that no such attack has been repeated in the U.S. since 9-11, simply because they've taken these measures. Right. So uh, the la closing thoughts here is going on that global thing. There are so many other crimes that didn't exist before. Uh, anonymous hacking, taking down data, um, Chinese espionage, uh, the, um. the kind of proxy wars that are going on between China and the United States, Iran and the United States. Uh, where do we stand in all of this? How prepared are we? Will this law make a dent in any of that? Uh, you know, um, so surveillance and espionage, I think, will happen. Uh, commercial espionage will continue. Uh, 
So the, the Cybercrime Prevention Act uh, will provide some sort of protection if you can prove it. I mean, that, that would be a situation where the people conducting the espionage would not be very good if they are mm -hmm. caught. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the Cybercrime Pre Prevention Act could, could help uh, people who are victimized by, by that kind of action. Now, if it's against an, uh, a government, uh, you know, it would be very difficult, I think, to bring uh, a criminal case against a, a government. Uh, certainly if they're doing uh, the surveillance from their own facilities. So uh, the ability of the United States to look at our uh, even the president's email. Yes. I mean, we have government agencies that use Gmail. Yes. Right? Uh, if you check their yes. email accounts. And so what that means is that Gmail is in a position to know, uh, Google is in a position to know, and Google has already demonstrated that, that if asked by the U.S. government, they will surrender data. And that, that's without even uh, considering that the U.S. government itself might even be connected to the telcos directly, that they may already be scraping that data. Uh, just on a mat as a matter of course. Yes. Um, so it's a very difficult uh, problem and there's no easy solution, but I think the Philippine government, if it wants to protect itself, they can institute policies certainly within the government to say, look, if you're going to send an email from .gov to .gov, then it, it stays within a closed system mm -hmm. that does not leave the, the, the Philippines. So let's, to close, let's go back to the Supreme Court rule, ruling yes. that we're all waiting for. Yes. Um, I asked you your best case scenario. Um, in asking for your worst case scenario, I guess I'll also ask you to, to evaluate, is the Supreme Court tech savvy enough to actually look at all of the different dimensions of it? Because certainly the drafting of the law uh, seemed to miss many points. Do we have a savvy enough Supreme Court? And what is leading to that? Your, your worst case scenario, what will you do? Uh, we'll, we'll file a motion for reconsideration. You do it uh, again. Right. Um, when the oral arguments happened uh, last year, uh, and I was looking at the justices, and my assessment is that uh, certainly on issues of constitutional law, uh, all of them are, are well-versed. Yes. On the issues of technology, there are varying, uh, varying levels of understanding. Um, but I think it, uh, there are enough members of the court who understand the issues, and even those who are less knowledgeable, even though they don't understand the specifics of the technology, they can still see how the technology works to, to the point that it affects uh, fundamental rights. So I, I'm, I'm not scared that the Supreme Court will come up with a technic, sort of a technically erroneous decision. I think it will be, it will be uh, measured, I think they will uh, understand the issues, the technical issues as well as the legal issues and they'll come up with a, um, a fair decision. At, at least that's the, that's my take on, based on the, my observations during the oral arguments. Fantastic. Thank you right. so much, JJ. We've been speaking with attorney JJ Decini. He's one of the top IP lawyers in the country. He, his name is on the case uh, that the cyber, on the cyber, against cybercrime law that the Supreme Court is now debating. We're waiting for the decision. Uh, the outcomes of the Supreme Court decision on the cybercrime law, it is one year after petitioners questioned this controversial provisions. You've heard some of his thoughts. Continue the conversation and we'll watch out for it. I'm Maria Ressa. Thanks for joining us.